good to see you guys again. I hope everything is going as well as it possibly can. Today I want to talk to you out of Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 12 through 16. And what I've entitled today's message is simply, Shine Your Brightest Light. And my feeling behind that is, as I reflect Christ, as Christ has called me to be the light of the world, I want to do that to my maximum capacity. I want to be everything that he's called me to be and be able to set a great example to believers and non-believers as well. I was thinking about the moon, and the moon reflects the light of the sun. Now, if anything got in between the moon and the sun, then it couldn't reflect. So there has to be a clear path. But really, the as I look up at night and I see the moon, I see how bright it is. The brighter it is, it's just reflecting really more of the sun. And that's how we are. Any brightness that I have in my life, any light that people can say that, that, I, that we have is because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And here I believe in this scripture, Paul reveals some ways that we can shine our brightest light forth. So if you'll go ahead and let's begin to read uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my present, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that that day of Christ I may be uh, proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Be with us as we study scripture. Help us, God, to hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against you. Amen. Now, I believe in this scripture, it, re it reveals a couple things. The first thing that I, I believe it reveals is actions that will lead us to br being bright lights, to being the lights that God has designed us to be. But it also shows us some actions that we should avoid, some things that we should, we should fight against and avoid at all costs, and, and that way we, we don't dim our lights, that we don't dim our witness um, of Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing I see here in verses 12 and 13, it reveals these secrets of how to be bright lights, how we can be the brightest possible light. In verse 12, the first thing that I see is we need to let our light shine regardless of who is around us, regardless if somebody's around us or nobody's around us or the whole world is around us. We need to make sure that we let our light shine. Paul commended the Philippians whenever he said, obey me in my presence and when I was not there. He said, you are obedient in whenever I was there and whenever I, I was not there. And from that, I gained that principle that I need to make sure that I am focused in what I'm doing, whether I feel the presence of God or whether I do not feel the presence of God, whether I think I'm doing uh, everything that I can do or whether I think that maybe I'm slacking a little bit. I need to make sure because I can't go by feelings and emotions. I need to make sure that I am trying my best to chase after God and say whether I feel like it or whether I don't, whether I have an audience or whether I do not, God, I'm going to chase after you and seek your face regardless and try to live as a Christian. The next thing that I see is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I need to do my very best to mind my own business. As people, we have a tendency to tell, be able to tell other people what they're doing wrong. Maybe look at some complaints, some, some different things in people's lives that we don't like. And sometimes we miss our faults and our failures. Now, it doesn't mean we have to sit on our faults and failures and let them become the thing that we worship and, and the thing that holds us back. No, God's not saying that. But he is saying, listen, this salvation is so important that you have to work it out yourself. Now, working out was a term that they used in mind, and it meant to dig out. It took a little time to, to, to mine that silver that they were mining for. You had to get into the mine and dig it out and work it. Well, that's how it is with our salvation. The more I read the Bible, the more I pray, the more I seek God, the more time I spend with Him, the more time I have invested in Him, what am I doing? I'm trying to work out my salvation. I'm trying to realize, God, this is what you've called me for. This is what I'm going after. Let me do it wholeheartedly, but let me do it in a way that my light shines the brightest for you. And uh, that's where we want to be. Amen? Amen. Verse uh, number 13 and it says, for God who works in you. So Paul's saying, listen, you're a believer. You love Jesus Christ. Now understand that God is working in you. Now, he goes on to say, um, both to will. So his will, so we want his will to take over our lives. That means he, we have to be willing to allow him to change our desires. 
not just merely shift them, but to change our desires. We were once of the world, but now we're of Jesus Christ, and we want to give him control over our desires. So the things that I did previous or pre-salvation is not things that I want to chase after I've been saved. So I have to say, God, what desires do I have that it needs to, to, needs to get rid of so I can focus in on what you've called me to do, that thing that you've destined me to do? I want to change my desires. And the only way I know to do that is continuously surround yourself with word, uh, with the word of God, with the power of Jesus' presence, and then your desires will begin to change because he goes on to say, and to work. So we see that our desires are going to change and then and to work. We have to allow God to equip us. God has called us for a work. So our desires will change, and then we'll say, and then he'll say, okay, now that you want to do good instead of doing bad, now that you want to increase instead of decrease, now that you want to help people instead of hurt people or, or release people instead of hold them back, now let's go do it. Well, then we have a tendency to say, wait a second, God, I don't know if I can do that or not. Well, we have to be willing to go out and try and then allow God to equip us. And God, give us the, that power that we need, give us the resources that we need, but we have to be willing to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you that not only are my desires, that as my desires change, and not only are my desires going to change, but I trust you that you're going to give me the resources, that you're going to help me with my attitude, you're going to give me the words, and you're going to give me what I need to be able to be successful, to be that brightest light that you've designed me to be. But I have to be willing to go back and say, okay, God, I want to shine my light the brightest, whether anybody's around or not. I want to make sure that I concentrate on what you have given to me and that I own that and I work it out to the best of my ability. And I also want to make sure my desires change. And I also want to make sure that I do the work that you've called me to do. Now, he goes on in verses 14, 15, and 16. And he really shows us some actions to avoid so that we don't put uh, we don't we don't make our light dim. We the, we won't put it out. And the reason why I use the word dim because in verse fifteen it says, "Among whom you shine as lights in the world." Now we're saved. We love Jesus Christ. He's in our heart, and we're His children. So we are a light. We are marked in the spiritual world. It's not a choice. But after this, it's learning. It's learning to allow our lights to shine the brightest that it possibly can. That way we can influence the most people to fall in love with Jesus Christ and chase after him and let their lives change forever. That's our purpose. You know that, and I know that. But what we can't do is allow stuff to constantly make our lights dim. We want them to shine bright. We don't want any kind of um, thing to get in the way between us and Jesus. And he says, here are some actions that we can avoid. Because we want to protect our brothers and sisters. We want to not at any cost hinder the gospel. The first one that I see here right out of the gate, Paul attacks it, grumbling and disputing. Verse 14, and complaining, or you might say complaining and arguing. He says, let there be none, okay? Don't let this happen at all. He didn't say, well, if you think you're right and somebody else is wrong, or if you know you're right and somebody else is wrong, or if you think you've been cheated, or what he said, don't let there be any complaining and arguing. And, and I began to process why, and I began to think that, you know, really whenever we complain and whenever we argue, what we're doing is we're making gateways for our anger to spill out. We make a gateway for dishonesty to creep in. We make a gateway for our loose lips or for the opportunity for gossip to take control. Or just sometimes we allow jealousy to creep in through our complaining and arguing because it opens up the door. It's a gateway for those things to start. The biggest thing, what it does is it takes the focus off of what Christ is doing and puts it on self and what I'm not getting or what I need to be doing or what, whatever, it could be dot, dot, dot. So we need to make sure that we guard ourselves about complaining and arguing because we don't want to be a gateway for those type of things. We need to remember that whenever the spotlight is on us because we choose to let our anger spill out, we choose to be dishonest, we, we allow these things to creep in and take over what we do is we take the spotlight that's on Jesus and that we're trying to, to make sure the whole world knows him and then we turn that light on ourselves. Now, we get everything that spotlight gets. <laughs> And Jesus can handle the spotlight way better than we can handle the spotlight. So make sure we keep that spotlight on him and we hold our grumbling 
in our complaining. complaining. Now, in verse 15, he talks, he, he explains why this is so important. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 15. It says, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So here he talks about the world. He says, listen, they're crooked and they're twisted. And, and that's very hard to say, but you've got to understand that the world, right, the world doesn't think like Christians think. They think opposite or different. So we have to realize that that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. But whenever he says blameless and innocent, he means harmless. What he wants us to be is constantly checking our motives. That we could be blameless, that the world doesn't have more things that they can throw at us. We don't want to be our enemy. We want to be able to fight the enemy. But it's hard to fight the enemy whenever we're acting like the enemy. And that's what Paul's saying. We can't do that. We need to be blameless. We need to be without blemish or fault. Uh, we, we don't need to be censored is another way. And I pray that our actions as Christians would not, cause, uh, would not be a cause for, for being censored. That if it's because you don't like that I preach Jesus Christ or the world doesn't like that, that's one thing. But because I let anger spill out of me or dishonesty or something like that, now I have to be censored. Now, I want to make sure that doesn't put any kind of, uh, make my light be dim at all. And then as, as he talks there and he says blameless and innocent, we want to make sure that our motives are to help and increase and impart, not to take away. Right now, we know that as we look at the life of Christ, as we look at the life of Stephen, as we look at the life of Paul, the things that these men were accused of was really bogus. It wasn't true. They made up things. So we know that people will make up things that aren't true. We don't need to give them reasons for things to be true. Now, we need to be re quick to repent, and we all fall short of the glory of God. But if we'll fight against these actions and avoid the arguing and the complaining, then it won't open up the gate for these other things. So what happens whenever we have anger and we allow that to spill over? Well, what it does is it interjects fear into people. It even riles them up. So some people, if, you're, if we, sh we lash out in anger, they'll not want to visit with us anymore. They'll not want to talk to us and be around us. For others, it will allow anger to rise up in them, and then they've got a reason to combat. And that's not what we want. If, it's, it's hard to lead people whenever they won't follow you. <laughs> and if we have anger problems that are spilling out and people won't want to follow us, then how can we lead them to Jesus? Dishonesty, right? That's a trust issue. If, if we're making dishonest gains or we're doing, doing something dishonest that we know and people see that, but then we go up to them, we tell them about the love of Jesus Christ and, and how much he cares for them and what he did, but yet they can't trust us and they don't know what we're saying is really true. And what do we do? We, we wind up leading people further away from Christ and we don't want to do that. Gossip tears down people. It, it makes people think that they can never measure up, that they're less than. Ooh, we got to guard our lips and make sure that we encourage and lift up because we want people to follow us to the cross. And I know that if we tear down people, if people feel tear down, or if, if people can think they can never measure up, or they're constantly getting hurt, they don't want to follow. They want to kind of stay as far as they possibly can. And jealousy, right? Which jealousy is in many ways a cover for insecurity. And if we're a constant competition, if we can't celebrate the wins of others, celebrate the accolades and the accomplishments, celebrate uh, gifts and things that they receive, and just, just have fun with them and realize that blessings fall on everybody, then people want to be around people like that. People want to be around people who celebrate with them and are not always competitive and in competition, you know, that we celebrate one another. So don't let jealousy win. But complaining and arguing can allow an open door for all of those. And then what we do is instead of Push, pushing the gospel forward instead of letting our light shine as bright as it possibly can, we wind up apologizing and apologizing. And what do we do? Instead of being able to spread the gospel, we're trying to apologize for things that hinder the gospel. And that's what Paul's writing here. Don't complain and don't argue. And we know that ultimately keeping the light of the gospel on the true source of light, which is Jesus Christ, is the most effective way. And whenever we don't complain and we don't argue, and we try our best to get along and live in peace, then we know that God has all the spotlight and he is the true source of light. And then the second action that we want to avoid is we want to make sure that we do not hold on to the world. We, we've got to, Paul writes 
in, in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. Hold fast with all of our might, hang on. Let's read it and study it and chase after it and let it become a part of who we are. What's the word of life? Well, we know the word of life is Jesus Christ. He's the true light, he's the true life, and he's the true word. So we, under, we understand that if we want our life to be advanced, then we have to be steadfast in Christ. It causes the life that we have to be advanced, which in our life will be advanced. Now, this doesn't mean just hold the fort, okay? <laughs> we don't want to, we won't wanna just sit back and hold the fort down. We want to protect our brothers and sisters, and obviously that's what we're trying to do here at Ray of Hope, coming through camera and these different things, and we have our pews taped off, and we have sanitation, uh, hand sanitizer outside, and, and mask, and these different things, because we want to protect our brothers and sisters. Uh, we we want to do those things. We want to make sure that our brothers and sisters are taken care of, and help them any way we can. But that's not the only thing that we were meant to do. It's to go and preach the gospel to the world. Matter of fact, Paul says, I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He wants the, his friends, the Philippians, and I'm sure that now we're reading it, he wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to hold fast to this gospel. Why? So at the end of this thing, we didn't do any of this in vain. The, the, the run is a very neat word because it, it, it gives us the idea of energy or preparation. Good runners have used a lot of energy on the track. Long distance runners have to prepare their bodies. Sprinters have to prepare their bodies. They have to study their opponents. There's some preparation before the race. And then they have to release all of that energy that's been with inside of them for that moment. And Paul is here saying that we did not run in vain. It takes energy to be a Christian. It takes energy to set these things up. And then he goes on and he says, labored. Oh, we understand labor, right? It's the tool of ministry that we have, the tilling of the ground. It's the cross, uh, the, 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 the cost of, of what we do. It's also uh, the toll on the body, you know, because sometimes, you know, it does get heavy at times. And we know the Bible says not to be anxious, and we don't want to be anxious. But we know that there is labor involved. There's preparation involved. And Paul is saying, listen, all this that we do, we need to hold on to this gospel. Because if we hold on to the world, then everything that we think we're doing is in vain. But if we hold on to the gospel, if we hold steadfast to the word of life, then we know that what we're doing is for a purpose. And I know that you can't let go until we let go. And so, okay, now I'm going to change my grip and say, God, I'm going to hold fast to your word. So we know that God has called us to be these bright lights. It's going to take, it's going to take energy, it's going to take preparation, and it's going to take advancing the word, but we know that. So just some ending thoughts, obedience, Minding our own salvation, our own business to the best of our ability. Allowing God to change us and our desires and allowing God to equip us. These are all actions that if we continue to walk in, then we know that we can grow and be that, light, that brighter light that God has designed us to be. Now, we want to guard ourselves against that arguing and complaining and holding on to the world. And we all have a tendency to, to do these things and lend ourselves. But if we'll avoid it and guard ourselves then we know that we could be the brightest possible light, that we can reflect Jesus to the greatest extent that he's ordained us and created us to be. Hey, we love you guys, and we will see you guys next time.